I've long thought about uh, individual persona or, or personas and this, this idea of um, ever-evolving identities. For example, you know, people who have work and non-work personas, you know, you've got the arsehole in work and then his nicest pie out of work, the surprising competitive aggression at the work, social dues, um, the extroverted party goer, Kind of like Henry, the mild mannered janitor, morphing into um, morphing into Hong Kong Fu, if anyone even remembers that. And what does this mean for the authentic you? Who actually are you? And and I think I've come to the conclusion for myself that the times that I felt uncomfortable with the way I've sort of behaved in certain scenarios is uh, is more to do with dissatisfaction with the environment and company that I've been keeping, rather than you know myself. And 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 eventually, you know, I've taken action to sort of change those those things that were making me unhappy. This this led me to thinking about, you know, why, for example, institutions, companies, communities, social networks seem to exhibit their own personality and, you know, employees, members or whatever can start to take on that personality and behaviors, which might be at loggerheads with their own, you know, sort of individuality and makes me think how malleable is our own individuality? How do we unearth that authenticity when we strip away the masks and show ourselves devoid of of external influences and do these scenarios exist in bands you know especially in in artistic or creative collaborations which is really for me the the, the sort of the very essence of individ, individuality coming together you know how do we as collaborators come to get together to achieve common goals you can tell my life's getting smaller and smaller isn't it thinking about this stuff so my, my guest today is about to bring out his first record with his two long-standing friends and co cohorts who had so much acclaim as a trio prior to its hi hi uh, hiatus, sorry, seven years ago. And, you know, their reunion and reconnection, the making of this record, perhaps they'll provide some, some answers to, to these most mind-churning questions for me. So it's a real pleasure to welcome Neil Cowley to the show. Neil, welcome. Thanks for, so much for coming on. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. So we've got to, what about a week, two weeks to go? I think till mm -hmm. the till the till the record comes out, till Entity comes out. Yes. How how are you how are you feeling? How do you usually sort of feel in the in the run up to to new music coming out? And is this the feelings that you're getting now? Are these a little bit different, maybe? Um, it's interesting you say that because I woke up this morning, funnily enough, and I thought, how do I feel about this record yeah. coming in two weeks? I asked wow. myself that very quickly, <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm. It, it's a it, it's a it's a it's a it's changed a lot over the years, mainly due to the way the industry works. I, I think mm. you know if you cast your mind back to when we brought our first album out in two thousand five, mm. um, it was very a release was a momentous occasion, yeah. and had a sort of a there was a. a a time a time frame around it um where you could enjoy or stand back and observe the fruits of your labor whereas now of course with everything streaming and everything happening so fast you've got a, it feels like you've got about two and a half hours on the morning of release day when you feel that thing um so there it's it's multifaceted in a way um one of the positive things that I think comes of uh, the way things are released today is that I find myself listening to my own music as a as a as a punter, as it were, as a listener ah, okay. on the on the morning of release. Yeah, uh, these all these streaming platforms they have their own kind of little uh, compression settings anyway, so you hear them in a unique way. But I'm, I, it's the first time anyway psychologically I'm able to listen to the music from the outside and get us some perspective on it. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the moment when mm. I listen to the music with objectivity. Um, and then I'm, um, and this also ties into how I feel about my music generally. I, I, I kind of have a, I have that morning where it happens and then I have a 12 year lapse then after which I can't listen to it at all. And then 12 years later, I can listen to it a second time with objectivity. Um, wow. But you're, you're right. This is, a, after, this is after a seven year hiatus. This is a special thing. We've all been off doing mm. our own thing. I've been off doing um I've been off doing solo yeah. projects. And the joy of releasing a record has been diminished by that, been diminished by the uh the independent nature of doing that. That's one of the reasons I brought us back together to, was to interact and to remind myself of the collaborative nature of what we do. Mm. Um, I've even said in the bio of this uh, album that um the reason it's called entity is because we leave our individual selves at the door. Uh, mm. I, I was reminded of that the first day we got back together. I was reminded of just how 
we are this thing bigger than our individual selves. Um, it's beautiful, actually. It is. Well, it's beautiful when you have brotherhood or sisterhood yeah. and you feel like you're a family. It's not when the opposite's true. Um, it's it's fascinating. It's really fascinating this for me. Like uh, you, you know, I, I I'm really sort of interested in in how people come together. Mm. You, you know, and and sometimes you know, there's there's instincts that sometimes you, you know where it kind of clicks straight away when you first get to know somebody and you know that you can work with them in whatever way you know you imagine. There's uh, then there's a, there's other people that sort of take their time to get to know to get to know their other, the, the, you know, the other collaborators, you know, I, I just think it's really interesting how you, how you know, and then, um, and, and it's also, I was going to ask you about, had you, had you stayed in touch whilst, you know, from the time that you went on hiatus and you were doing your solo stuff? We had stayed in touch. We stayed in touch. Uh, with, I mean, the, the, the other two guys are an Aussie and a Kiwi. So we have, yeah. I mean, Anytime there's an Ashes cricket series, we oh yeah, yeah, plenty of banter go <laughs> rib each other. Exactly. So it was always like that. So it was once every yeah. sort of four months, and it was it was civil when we parted. It was civil throughout, and it was civil yeah, yeah. reunited. But I was very interested in what you said there about um, what you in kind of what you give of yourself or how you begin mm. to collaborate. It's an interesting point because um, as well as having the trio, I often I do get to collaborate with lots of people in various mm. guises. I have done over the years. And um, it's it's interesting how much you give of yourself in order to bridge the gap between you. Um, like if I was accompanying a vocalist, for instance, I would I would perhaps shut down large parts of my more vivacious personality, mm. my more outgoing personality, in order to cradle them and and to feel for them to feel comforted yeah. and cradled. And I suppose you know th that might be less enjoyable in terms of my art i mean it, it's don't get me wrong it's a lovely thing to do it's a lovely thing to to know that you can cradle someone and you can you can create the platform for them to to mm. uh, get from and to flourish and to shine but in terms of that's the difference i suppose between that and the trio in the trio i think i i very much feel that everyone brings themselves as they totally are there's no yeah. compromise and and that is a, a very special chemistry that we have where we're able to collaborate and and feel that we're giving all of ourselves, but then we are giving ourselves to something bigger as a whole. Mm. I think that I think that, again, this this is a sort of interesting thing about you know, you know what I was saying in the intro, you know about personas and identity and and, and almost. Um, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, I remember you know talking about a real difference in personas. I remember reading an interview with Karen O from the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, and she was talking about you know when she's on stage. You know, she wears a very, you know, kind of bright outfit, very gregarious, outgoing, off stage, like completely, like socially awkward, doesn't want to talk to people. You know, but the stage gives her this this different sort of thing. It makes me think, you, you know, that that yeah, that about this, you, you know, when do you feel uncomfortable at? Um, you know, perhaps like the way that you're behaving, do you feel inauthentic? You know, what you were saying then, you know, about, you know, going to going into the studio with singers and you tone certain things down. I guess that's a kind of intuition thing, isn't it? You're reacting to. Yes, I, mean, I think very intuitive. The intuition is a good word because I think, I think it is intuitive. And I think you 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 garner that talent and you 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 grow you grow on that that, that ability grows within you to to mm. to read the room uh, I, going back to what you said about the change in persona that is something that i'm 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 i've always wanted to explore more i, I have a friend who who observed david bowie once backstage mm. going from the dressing room it, it was a long tunnel apparently i can't remember where the gig was but it was a it was a stage and then a long tunnel and then he said the the guy he stood next to just outside the dressing was was a kind of guy that you'd meet you'd be feel comfortable next to in the lift it was just a, yeah. a you know that and he said he saw him walk and he saw his walk change and he turned into David Bowie within that sort of wow. ten or twenty steps I mean I really admire that I really admire that and uh, I think Beyonce talks about the same thing doesn't she she's got a, a name for her character that just escapes me for the moment um, yeah. um I I. I'm a big admirer of, of that, and I like that sort of cutoff. I think, um, I think, I by by nature, I tend to just roll onto stage as a sort of bumbling idiot that I think I feel I am, and 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 I try and engage with people on that front. I try and there's a lot there's a lot of sort of schizophrenia on the performance. There's um, 
there's 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 moments of deep melancholy but then mm. i suppose in a true english fashion right after we've done that we tend to then just rib ourselves and 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 break the atmosphere for fear of it sort of you for it all, all getting a bit too heavy um yeah yeah so i suppose i suppose we are in, in our case we tend to be what we are off stage what we are um it tends to be the same as what we are on stage mm. uh, i forget I think, your question what you're saying there though is it was, it was a good point i can't remember now <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I think I think it was about it was it was about those sort of individual again again about those sort of individual personas and 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 how you how you know what side of your right. your sort of persona to you know kind of bring out. We, you know, it's, and, and again, it's it makes you think, doesn't it? When you're in the in 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 a certain role, for example, if you know if you if you're if you are the musician or if you're the the engineer, if you're the producer they all have roles and 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 i guess a you know kind of producer especially has to think about the the personalities and how to get the best out of them well we, we were lucky enough on this occasion to work with one of the best producers mm. actually yeah that, that was in beautifully um a, a man called ethan johns um, yeah anyone who knows ethan um his heritage is uh, unquestionable his father was glenn sure. johns according yeah. to the beatles and everything else and jimmy hendrix and uh, he's passed all his talent and all his production skills onto his son Ethan. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a, it was funny actually. I've become friends with Ethan over the over recent years, doing other bits and pieces with him. And I said I was going to make this record, and he said, uh, "Oh, I'll come an engineer." Because at heart, Ethan is actually an engineer. That's engineer. His, right. That's, that's my uh, assessment of mm. Ethan. He's he's happy place. He's definitely engineering. He likes just being in front of that board and making it all happen. Yeah. Uh, so he said, I won't say a word, you know, I, I won't, I won't interfere. I won't make any commentary. And, and, and half of me thought that's not going to happen because I know Ethan and Ethan is a hell of a strong personality and he's one of the world's most natural producers. Mm. And the reason he's such a good producer is because he, he engages with the human beings. He mm. understands people and he gets right into the heart of the story. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's a brilliant, brilliant people manager and people person. So we, we spent the first day with him zipping his mouth and, uh, I'll be actually doing that on occasion going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, and we get to the end of sort of a take and we go, is, is it that one or the other one? And he sort of go, uh, oh no, no, I won't say anything. And I, in the end, I sat him down. I said, Ethan, you, you, you realize you are producing this record. And he said, oh, am I? And I said, yeah, you are. And, and I really, I really, really want you to please because um, it would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And then from that moment on, he openly produced the record and we were in, in his hands. And and I think the whole thing was recorded in about three days. He mixed it in a further four. And uh, I mean, he actually wow. saved, saved me a bucket load of money because he's such a, he's such a quick mover and a quick thinker. Um, so that was a, that was a, yes, a, a beautiful example of role, role playing in the studio. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, is that typically how, how you, you like working to, 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 do things quickly almost like that that kind of um okay well this this is it this is it the raw the rawness of it if you will yes we like to include mistakes um yeah. and, and i've got an extremely low boredom threshold as anyone will tell you so i i, I do like to move on quickly i think yeah. i also think I, i'm not a, a massive fan of the sort of fatigued third and fourth take i like far first and second takes i've even yeah. gone as far as um uh, well, I remember one occasion producing another record for someone else. I, I got the violinist to, to walk into the studio without knowing the tune. And I said, we're going to record you learning it. And that's it. Wow. And that was really interesting. And and his, his first reaction was, don't be ridiculous. This is, you know, because this, this, that little sound rubbish. And But what you heard when he came back into the control booth, what you heard was his ears on absolute stalks. And this lovely, mm. he, he was listening like he won't, wouldn't listen again for the next 30 40 50 right. takes if ever it was fascinating that's uh, incredible i mean that that's sort of similar in in a way to i forget which film it was but it was the it was the one the the, the film i think it was a french film that miles davis did the soundtrack for that's right yes i've seen that yes yeah. did, he, did he do it in that way was it, it just watching he he, right? he 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 watched that he was invited to watch the film just just miles davis to watch the film by the director he watched it and maybe watched it twice um and then went back to the to the to the band and explained the film and then said right there we go that's <laughs> all that they got <laughs> yeah, yeah. that sounds very miles davis i yeah. mean he's famously the man who used to say here's your counting one yes and that was it <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it's it's interesting what you what you you're talking about there. I mean, this this sort of spontaneity or not, we we've mm. approached it in various different ways. For instance, on our 2014 album Touch and Flee, we we um we learnt it to the nth degree. We had to. It was very very complicated music, but I don't I didn't want to be stuck to that mold. Mm. So in 2016, when we brought out our, the album previous to this, Spacebound Apes, it was very much a concept piece, and it was very much a, it, it was about this character Lincoln who went through some sort of mental experiment and ended up in this galaxy a solar system full of planets that were um designed by humans so, so yeah. each planet was a human emotion and each planet was given over to that human emotion so you had a planet that was devoted to um duty and one to grace and one to it so it, it, it he was this was his exploration but i gave the music to the guys on the morning of the recording and we we just in three or four days we just bluffed our way through it and it, it sounded like that and and you know people have to remember this is i mean ethan would, would uh, attest to this a, a, a recording is just a moment in time and and, it, and yeah. it, it's just a caption of something so if as, as long as you capture where you're at at that moment that's all that matters in a way yeah i mean it's i mean it's interesting about the you know the you know you say about mistakes I mean, I've, I've listened to the album and it's, it's fantastic i, I mean i could I can't hear any any sort of mistakes, but I'm sure that you, that you you can. But but it, but but I I do I do like that that approach where you can hear mistakes. It's always like I, I like listening to to live albums where you hear I don't know like you know guitar slightly out of tune, chord slightly out of tune, or a drum comes in slightly wrong. Uh, for me, it kind of shows that they're they're human and they're fallible. Again, this is uh, this is the way that we record anyway. And another, this is what Ethan does. He captures that moment, and we all yeah. play together. This is something that doesn't happen quite so much anymore. Um, but it, it, but it, it, there are mistakes in there. All the takes on the record, you will get you will get depending on who you ask, it will be their best performance or they're not not so good performance. But they will give way to the greater picture. Yeah. In if it has a certain something about it, I mean, there yeah, there's a couple of moments where. There are certainly moments on that record where we all fluff it and we didn't didn't get what we intended to achieve. I mean, as you say, only you didn't hear it because you didn't go in there with that preconceived idea. You're just listening to what's presented. Very, to you. very true. And and uh, but we did. So we have to. But then you learn in your in your early days. I think as a, as an artist or a musician, you you with especially with all the technology available to you, you there's a tendency and there's a temptation to go right. I want to correct everything. And once you start doing that, I mean, everyone knows about quantize now, making everything land on the beat. Once you yeah. start down that slippery slope, you're screwed, really, because yeah. it's just going to sound like everything else. We well, see. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? That this, uh, you, you know, if if your if your personality, part of your sort of makeup, is that you 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 are a perfectionist, or you, you know, there's a difference between perfectionism and having a high standard. But you you know how with, with the technology that's available how you can how far do you want to go how far does your is your is your is your mind going to push you you know yeah, to getting that, that perfect that perfect piece that, that's yeah that's hard to answer because i i am a perfectionist to a degree but i think i've just learned that that's not great i think that's mm. where i'm at i think i've learned that that's just not great and what will yeah. not to great result i mean it can do but mm. it'll be pretty agonizing and and i and the more you the more you adhere to the idea of perfectionism the less human it tends to sound and feel and that, that certainly is the difference between my solo stuff um not that the solo stuff was perfect perfect but there there was the capacity to 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 chisel away at it more mm. it's for the trio stuff like i say it's just what you hear on those records that happened in the room at that point and we only ever did three takes at most of each tune and that was the one the one that you hear is the one that we decided yeah that's got the most mm. to it um yeah i don't know at which point i gave way to that to the perfectionism thing but it, you know, it's yeah it? I, I wonder i wonder I, I feel that there are more of these um you, you know kind of dualities in our lives you, you know where, where where you have these almost like what on the face of it look like different completely opposites you know, I, I like my, for example, like sort of my, for a large part of my life, I, I, I was, you know, analytical about things. I would sort of, so if I had a choice of something, I would think about the options, you know, I'd like, you know, kind of go through in detail. I think, well, what about that? What about that? Mm, I don't know. What about that? And then I would, I would also have my, 
instinct, almost like pulling me in the other direction, just saying, just trust your instinct. Yeah. You know, and, and and that sort of caused me some change. And I've got a lot better at it now. I use my instinct a whole lot more. And it's interesting because like that, like, you know, 99 times out of 100, your instinct is right, isn't it? You know, you 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 kind of get it right. But then but I've learned to sort of push that analytical side to the uh, analytical part of me to the side a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a hard ask, and um, uh... but he said, sorry, so I'm just thinking with the, with the with the perfectionism thing. If you you know if you are a sort of perfectionist, you can you can do be an ultra perfectionist now with this sort of technology. But then there's some part of you that's obviously saying, you know, let's leave yeah. it. Yeah, well, there is, there is, and and I mean, if it's, like I said, the temptation's never been bigger. Mm. But, Unfortunately, you're dealing with you're dealing with a finite choices. Yeah, you have a finite choice, which is decided by a piece of software. Yeah, um, and that, I mean, that, that for the vast majority of people, that doesn't bother them either way because the function that they have for music in their lives is just it 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 sort of it's it's not the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, I suppose I can I I'm, I I resign to the, the to the idea that I'm making music for people who really care about music, and that's going to be a smaller you know, a smaller echelon of people. Mm. But certainly the people who really care about music will want to know that it's genuine, I think. But having said mm -hmm. all that, there's such joy and there's there's such there's such um, fun and exploration to be had with with collaborating with technology. I'm not against that at all. I mean I've right. had so much fun collaborating with technology. That's the zeitgeist after all. That's what's happening right now. There's some really interesting stuff to be had. I, I I completely agree and some people doing some really amazing and and innovative well, this is it uh, again and uh, it's the innovation i love innovation wherever it yeah. comes however it comes i mean we, we we're uh, people are sort of freaking out about ai and i understand why they are but i i can see once people start wielding it, they it will be wielded in an artistic way it's impossible to predict quite how that tallies up because it seems so automated but i'm sure that someone will make some art out of it and and art yeah. in a way that that conveys something I, i'm sure that they will or at least i hope they will I think there's this, the, you know, using AI, AI as an example. I mean, I, th I think, I mean, yes, there, there, there are probably some very real risks as, as to, you know, how it's implemented, how it's deployed, you know, and the, but there, there are also, there's also an element of fear of the unknown, I think, isn't there? Of, you know, if you think back to, you know, to God knows when, when, uh, you know, when CDs came out or when, oh. you know, Walkmans came out, it's like, you know, I remember my mouth was, well, you're going to wear headphones on, or, you know, and sort of wear them all the time. And it's like, you can't be, you can't do that. No, I totally agree. I, I, but I, I mean, I've, I've been through it. I've been through the, oh no, head in hands. This is, this is really bad. But then I, I don't think it's going to replace truly human music. And you make a very good point about the, 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 you know, the, the Walkman or think about the, 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 the portrait painter in the town square who suddenly realized when a camera turned up, oh, that, well, that's it. I'm done. I'm <laughs> yes. And yeah, then, true. Yeah. They had to adapt. They had to adapt. And they, and, and for a moment, there was a, a hell of a dip in their market. Um, and then, and then maybe not, you know, and then, and then they, they diversified or they went, OK, what is it? What's the true essence of what I give that the, the camera doesn't? Yeah. And, then, then the, and then what you end up with is a certain amount of people who give give up the chase. They give up the race mm. and they say, yeah, well, I, I'm I don't differentiate enough from this camera here. Yeah. And then you have other people that don't and become abstract or whatever. Well, so I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned, um, you know, about the uh, adaptation. You know, people sort of adapting because I think adaptability is one of the one of the kind of almost like sort of superpowers that that we need now because the the world is sort of so volatile and complex and and stuff like that. And I think that musicians really have lived with that. Yeah. I'm I'm interested for for you when 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 the trio went on hiatus, going into the solo stuff and then coming back to the to the trio. How how you adapted to those that very different environment yeah I, I i i there was there was concern about that because obviously bringing bringing anything back and it, and it being sort of viewed as in any, any way nostalgic i, mm. I worried had the world moved on too far mm. um that's right i i thought um i i did have my concerns i also had my concerns about how how the material would sound i i, I tried to bring elements of what I'd picked up and what I'd learned and how 
all these modern things that I, I felt I, I now had at my possession because I, I in that in that period of that solo period I went on a, a real learning curve about I, I bought I, I had a studio and I filled it full of electronic musical equipment I taught yeah. myself every pro you know elements of programming I hadn't ex explored before and since I went crazy on it and I tried to bring it to the um to the trio record i brought pre-production stuff pre-recorded and it was out the window within about two minutes because it just constrained us and held us back so so the debate goes on really as to what i've brought with me and how it fits in with this stuff i, I i'm it's not what i'm desperate not to be and what I, I wouldn't want to be is someone who's gone the past is best and the future is rubbish i, I really that's not yeah. good it's not, not good. a good idea and and so I I want to, I'm I'm all, almost more interested in the next record in a way because I think now that we've settled back and we and we've we've touched base again, I want to see where we can go with it. I do always want to incorporate this modern technology in because it's where we're at. And mm. and as you say, we evolve, we evolve as humans, um, and we adapt. And I think probably that the, the word synonymous with evolution is adaptation. That's what we do, and we're evolving. Or sorry things around us are evolving at such a bionic pace, we have to adapt yeah. or s sink or swim. Yeah, I completely agree. What, what, what do you think you learned most about yourself during that while you were working on your solo music, if, if um, anything? I learned um, that I'm, <laughs> I, I, I learned what it, it truly is to be solitary um, and mm -hmm. how that's not good for me. Right. Um, I have a tendency to do that. I'm an only child. Uh, me too. I, with my, oh, right. I got yeah. to play with my own toys on my own time, in my own yeah. space, my own pace. <laughs> and there is that within me. But it's not great. It's not great for me. Um, mm. um, it, it's, it's about, I think I alluded to it earlier, it's about, on release day, it's about sharing that experience with other people. That's so important. Um, and what you have around you as a young person is you have parents to tell you everything to, to share yeah. that, that they care as much as you do and I think that you you search for that throughout your life when you lose your parents having a band is a brilliant thing because yeah. when a good moment happens you turn around to to to, to, con to communicate with someone and say to, that cares as much as you do this was brilliant and they're not there but with a band you kind of have that they care as yeah. much as you do. I learned that, that about myself I learned that I am very adaptable because I did adapt yeah um, I I, I I learned that um, I had a lot, I had a lot in place. Typical me, I wanted to sort of deconstruct it all, but I learned that I had a lot of amazing things in place. And my my quest, once I had that realization, was to reconstruct a lot of it, um, mm. again, without looking back, but looking forward. So, yeah, I learned, I guess I, uh, in part I learned, I'm you know I'm a, I'm a bit of an ass really, you know, in certain ways. Because yeah, I, it's always meddling, you know, meddling and fiddling and wondering whether it could be better and can I push through a glass ceiling? And mm. I, I, I suppose, in essence, I learned I'm very happy. I can I, I can be very grateful and happy with just the things that happen on a daily basis without without aspiring too much. Mm, yeah. That's interesting. Mm. Go, come back to I mean, you know, go back to your childhood, you know, and the and the things that you remember as as you know, kind of formative influences. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's interesting. Like I, I have, <laughs> I have mine that I like. It's small. It's interesting. That they sometimes seem like small things that I remember. And I'm like, why do I remember that? And then I kind of think about it and it's like, ah, oh, yeah. And then there were a lot of things like, like, so my, my parents died a couple of years ago and, and, and that in, in the lead up to that, I'd, you know, kind of started to you start to think about these things, you know, because you realise they're not going to be not going to be around too much longer. Yeah, and and there was like some things like what do I what does really stick out stick out for me? And there were things that that, that happened that made me realise how I, um, if people don't trust what I say, it makes me annoyed. Oh, that's a good. <laughs> Because it happened to me when I was a kid. Basically, the the story that uh, just just sort of quickly, what happened to me was I was I was about maybe I don't know seven or eight, and and I was outside in the uh, you know living at living at home in the in the back field, which is big you know it's like a secondary school. We were playing playing football with, with my friends, and I had to go in because it was sort of tea time, you know. My mum would call me, you know, so I took the ball. It was <laughs> it was my ball. 
Oh yeah. So I took it, you know, and one of the one of my friends was was really pissed off, right? That I'd, I'd sort of take my ball. He went back to his mum and told his mum that I told him to fuck off, right? Which I hadn't. Yes. His mum went across to see my dad. The next thing is, by by the time I got in, I got inside. I, like my my mum said, "Oh, your dad wants to see you." I'm like, okay. So then this sort of came out, and anyway, the the long and short is that my dad didn't believe me. Believed that you know my friend's mum, you know, because she was an adult or whatever for whatever reason, that stayed with me. That little event stayed with me. That's bizarre, you know. I've got yeah. a, a one exactly the same. That, that, oh. that, 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 it, because I, it's my trigger. If someone doesn't believe me, yeah, it really upset. It, it, yes. I, I, I go from naught to a hundred. I don't. And I'm not saying I, I don't get like angry. Or, well, I, I just get so frustrated. I go internal. There was it was um I was at school. And um, I was playing in the playground, and for some reason, these three girls decided to sort of follow me around. You know, when you're mm. sort of seven or eight, and they just followed me around. We're going to follow Neil, and we're yeah. going to call Neil, Neil, Orange Peel, and we're going to do all that. And, da, da, da. and so yeah. they followed me around all lunchtime. And they got to the end of the lunchtime, and I said, Will you please go away? You know, go away, go away. And I went up, and I sort of mimed, I, I went to kick one of them. I mimed, but it was about that far away. The girl's mm. mum happened to be walking through the school gate at that time. And she saw it and she grabbed me. She went, you were kicking my daughter. And she dragged me in. And the deputy yeah. head stood me. And I was a good boy, you know. I was a good... yeah. And she stood me by that wall and she tore a piece off me. I was oh. devastated, absolutely devastated. And it lived with me. And and it really, like you, it really, it, if I had to pick three moments from my school, yeah. primary school life, that would be one of them. My mother was furious. And we bumped into this deputy head in the street about six months later, and she gave us such a filthy look, you know, because my mum was quite feisty. Um, but it, it really scarred me. And and that's a trigger for me. If anyone yeah. doesn't believe what I say, and I know it's true, oh, my goodness me. Exactly. Hmm. What that's, is that? That is ex- that's exactly, exactly it. What is that? that? Why, why, do we, why have we both experienced that? I don't know. I don't know. That's 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 so weird that we both experienced that sort Holy of... Child thing, is it? It must be. <laughs> Not being must be. Yeah, when you when you got siblings, you're just sort of used to, you know, all this sort of stuff going on all the time, and you have to kind of well, defend yourself. See, what we might be is oversensitive, and and that that yeah. might be a child thing, you know. I think we might be I, a little bit. I've I've def I've definitely that's definitely been part of my personality that that sort of very sensitive to certain things. I'm massively sensitive, and and, and it holds me back a lot, and yet sort of. Yeah as well i want to prove something i almost want to prove that that deputy head was wrong yes. uh, but at the same time every if i if i if somebody says someone says something nasty about me i mean i used to really get me bad now i don't read reviews or anything i don't read mm. re- records at all i can't cope with it and good or bad i just i, I just like i could do without the good as long as i don't get the bad I, it, i'll dwell too much and i'll believe that they're right as well it's, it's, yeah i'm 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 really the same i'm really the same i mean i think i've got i've got i've got I've got better um, about things, but the, yes, that that where I mean, I, I spent a lot of my life worrying about what other people would think of me. You know, for, you know, that's that sort of. I'm, I'm tons better with it now. I'm, you know, you sort of get to an age and you don't really care that much. You know, not as much, but it's still there. It's, it's still there. It's it, it, it can be it can be hard. Um, I, had it, I had it on Twitter recently. Someone can... oh, it's awful. Oh, I someone... had it on there. Someone misread what I said. I, I, I said something. I said, I said something. Oh, it was a compliment. I said something was really sweet. Someone said yeah. to me, and I went, "Oh, that's really sweet of you. Thank you." And then they tore a piece of me for using the word "sweet" against them, and I, and I, it it <sighs> it violated me absolutely. Uh, and I still, right. I still feel like I've, I've ever recovered. And it's that what you're talking about is that. Please believe me. But in my yeah. heart, I'm meant to be condescending or patronising. I would say it to anyone. And I just said that's really sweet. You, I didn't say you're sweet, or I, I didn't say any of those things. Oh, just that's really sweet. And yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing. And then, you know, that usually sort of, you know, ends up sort of creating a pile on and stuff like that. And then, and I like, oh my god, god. I, I find it, it's better to stay away from those. Pl- I mean, I, 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 I quit Twitter. Um, I just thought I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. No, I, I, I purely use it as a sort of a promotion. You, you, you have to do. I mean, the, these are like these con the consequences of yeah and technology and stuff like yeah, that I know. You, you yeah 
sort of spending your life on there and you think I should just be making music really. I, I, yeah. I, but there might be a sort of a great uh, abacus in the sky at the end, you know, and someone might sort of show to me in the amount of time I, I wasted on this rubbish and it might be quite the <laughs> final so, record. So when, when um, like again, when you're sort of growing up in and, and getting into music, what sort of, what sort of, people were you were you kind of did you sort of gravitate towards what people were you sort of hanging out with and stuff well i as a as a, as a child child i was sort of i was was classically trained so i was mm. sort of, i was thrust into envir- in situations and environments that i wasn't particularly comfortable with because it's um i i i had a quite a particular scenario in that that my um my piano teacher was a very influential man my first piano teacher very influential mm-hmm. very frightening man very nice man, but a very frightening man, about mm. nine foot, permanent pipe in his mouth, who um, he sort of, he, he heard about this boy who was playing hymns at school and just and took me out of there and taught me for free for about two years in order to get me into the Royal Academy of Music, which I went to on Saturdays. Wow. So I was, I, 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 I sort of, it, it, all this information was going in, all this technical ability was being, uh, I was being, trained in it but I wasn't necessarily thinking I was going to do anything musical it was only when I joined a soul band when I was 14 and I got into pubs and I thought it was a, it was a miracle and then I and then I allowed myself to teach myself everything beyond Shostakovich by ear um and um I was just I was surrounded by one of my earliest mentors I mean I still play a band with him now bless his heart I, one of my earliest Got mentors was was a guy called Martin who was in his mid twenties and 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 brought me into his band. It was mm. this band, and he was just I mean he was just a village idiot. And and I, and I I I but but what what he what he brought to it was something I think his father taught him was this rather amazing entrepreneurial spirit, which I think goes hand in hand with cre- creativity. Um, the philosophy at his father's company, his father was like an industrialist, was take on the job and then worry about how you do it later. And that was something that he instilled in me. So we would take a gig on. If someone said they wanted a gig, we'd go, yeah, we'll do the gig, and then worry about how we did it later. And it, and it gets you into all sorts of, you know, difficult situations which you have to dig yourself out of, which <laughs> I adore. That makes me feel alive. I still have it now, and and and, and it's very much filtered into the band, uh, the trio. We we loved, we, we've been sent by the British Council in the past to places like Khartoum and mm. Egypt. We were playing in Egypt when... In Cairo, when the, the the revolution was happening, literally the smoke was on the horizon. And, yeah, we, we've had some amazing time, and we love that. Incredible, you know? we love that. Um, so I, I would always, in yeah, answer to your question, I would always gravitate towards um, people who had that that edge of just uh, mm. um, generally people who like to. You had, you had to have a liking of James Brown when I was about 14 to 16. Otherwise, I wouldn't like you at all. So I, you had to like James Brown. But other than that, I didn't really stipulate. Um, uh, yeah, pe- pe- people who just, yes, pe- people who just say yes, a positive. Mm. Those kind I mean, of- I mean that's, that's, that's really, you know, kind of, it's just so infusing, isn't it? You know, when you, when you say yes to something, you accept it. You haven't got a clue how you're going to do it. Yeah. And just you, you know, but but again, that kind of shows how creative we can be, and and again, sort of adaptable, and just finding ways to, you know, to kind of make make things work. I mean, that's just so enriching. It's, it's not it's not going down a certain path and having everything sort of laid out. You follow procedures. It's literally using yourself, using your humanity to to get it done. Oh, Rex is a bit of a, a the bass player in the band with them mm. with them. Yeah, he's a bit of an educator, is Rex, and he's we call him the professor. He's, he's super, super intelligent. And I've heard him give talks about improvisation where he refers yeah. to improvisations just it is an experiment. He will say to people, just say yes to everything that I suggest, yeah. and then try that, and then and then say no to everything I suggest. And essentially, improvisation is just saying yes to everything that people, whatever people bring, you say yeah. yes, to it, you jump on it, and you repeat it, and you expand upon it. Yeah. Um, I think that's. It kind of ties into everything we were saying earlier about being in a live band. It's it's, um, mm. it's that it's that ability to 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 adapt in the moment and yeah. the what's around you. I remember did I did a I did a podcast uh, maybe last year sometime with Trevor Dunn. Um, um hang on. Um, he's oh, the, the who Trevor is. Trevor is the bass player. He's a bass player for Mr. Bungle, and he's also played with the Melvins. He's brilliant. Oh, Okay. And no, he's I also don't. done he's also done solo done, done some solo stuff, but he, he he did an album last year with Sally Gates, 
and it was it was completely improvised and it was it was it was um sort of based on some teachings of um a like a like a psychiatrist uh, probably got that wrong but uh or a psychiatrist not a psychiatrist psychologist anil chef um and it's about reality you know about a, a, a kind of like hallucinate uh, um you know hallucinatory reality and it was really interesting so so they basically kind of created this album did this album which is entirely improvised and it's about how far you can allow your brain to go to push the boundaries of what you're prepared to put onto onto a record it was phenomenal i mean really really kind of interesting exercise love to hear that yeah i mean I, I, that ties in i suppose with that thing about do do you improvise how far do you go with that? And, and how do you, how, do you, having the courage to turn up the studio and just record? Yeah. I mean, I'm into that big time. It just so happens we don't necessarily do that with this trio because, um, uh, because there still it remains this element of control freakery because I like to come with all the compositions and, and, and uh, because I have a vision, a uh, uh, so called vision. Um, but do you, I, you, but do, you, do you think, do you think you could let that go? Oh, I could. I, I, and I do in certain environments, mm. not in a recorded environment, um, so much. Um, but I love nothing more in the live environment. I mean, I, I, yeah. I yeah, I play in, I play in bands for fun where it's, it is just that, and and it's it's wonderful. It's, it, yeah. it's, there was a band called the Bays. I don't know if you remember them. The Bays. They never recorded anything. They only ever mm. played live. And what they played live was never the same twice. Um, yeah, I, I I'm, I'm a big fan of that stuff, and 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 I I I, I enjoy that language. I very yeah. much enjoy that language. Yeah, big fan. Of it. But like talking talk about that sort of. Related to improvisation, so you did a, did a um, you know like a remix album, um, which was what two thousand and oh, you mean the remix the solo stuff like yeah, remix of Hall of Memory, right? yeah, yes, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, didn't do it. How, how do how I mean how 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 do you feel about about sort of remixes and the and the different again a sort of different persona that a sort of song can take on depending on somebody's interpretation. Yeah, you know, I, I the remix that remix album. I've got to say it was a sort of an experiment for me. I hadn't done yeah. anything before, and, and I didn't feel any sort of great ownership of it because I, it goes, mm. I think I've got to, unless I'm involved from the start. You know, I sort of I don't yeah. know how to connect with it and relate to it. Mm. Uh, I mean, certainly in, in in historical terms, there's been there have been many examples of, of tunes or, or pieces of music where the the original the, the original composer's version hasn't been as good as the follow up. Mm. It, it, it takes that interpretation, that later interpretation with space and time away from it to yeah. give it a certain something. Um, and I, I, that's part of that battle, and isn't it? Again, of, of being the person who has originated this music, can you, can, how much are you allowed, uh, willing to give up and give away in order to give it that freshness? And that's the mm. permanent. I remember, I remember um, listening to uh, the a remix album uh done uh well it was in a uh, uh, the album was a certain ratios mm. comeback album i think it was uh and, and they did a remix album of it in 2021 some 22 something like that and it was phenomenal they, they, they gave it to gave it to several different producers and you know with no nothing just you know you create your own interpretation yeah and it was it was it was incredible i mean it was so so good just the, yeah. these different how songs almost like kind of morphed into something almost like a, a sort of living being. Yeah. You know? yeah it, I suppose the question then is when, when does it become something, in, when does it become an entirely new composition? I can think of a really sort mm. of quite a hybrid example of that. I don't know if you're aware of the, uh, the album that Philip Glass did of heroes that David Bell yes. is hero. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Album. I yeah. mean, I love the sound of that thing and I love the compositions, but I still, to this day, couldn't really tell you the connection between the two, the two the compositions. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah, I don't see any harmonic connection particularly, but I don't care. But um, that's that was an interesting remix. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, when, when does it become a different, uh, uh, like a new, a new yeah. composition almost? Is it, is it yeah. ever the same? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's quite that, that bit dubious that one, but 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 I mean, it, it's a great concept. And, yeah. and it, it's intriguing because you sort of put, I've listened to it sort of probably ten times more than I even might have done. But trying to work out what the germ of what the connection. <laughs> is. 
but it's brilliant. Who cares? But it, it is brilliant. What sort of what 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 role does curiosity play for for you? You know, as a, as a kind of individual, in, you know, in, in your your outside life as well as the band life, and also how important is it for the for the trio itself? Curiosity. Mm. Yeah. Uh, curiosity, yeah, curiosity is a big one. I, I, again, I think that's another one of those sort of uh, fuels in the fire, isn't it? Curiosity, mm. because without it, you just you're on a, a hamster's wheel. I think I have a, I have a, I have a deep curiosity connected to film. That happens. That's just one example of it. I I, I love obscure film, mm. and I I love um, I love watching film that goes as far as you can take it. Um, I like. I like discovering new directors. I like discovering new countries where I've missed out on the cinema entirely. I mean, the BFI are really good for that, the British Film Institute. Yeah. I, love, I love their cinema. I love their collection. I love their library. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm always curious, and, I, and I'm probably at my happiest when I'm at my most curious. Um, um, trying to, trying to, yeah, trying, trying to, uh, trying to work out the connect. Quite often, my, my curiosity is, is based around trying to find out the connection between the music I've just made and 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 the visual stimulus that I've just watched, and trying to trying to mm. piece that story together. I, I always, I, I always wonder about uh, you know with with curiosity, and again, I think I think I think it's really important the because it's it's something that you have as a kid when you when you first when you first born, you just you know you start getting into the world, you're so curious. And I, and I I wonder and I'm thinking back to it like when I was a kid and you you sort of in the um, you know pre digital you you know limited access to information or limited sources of information you had you really had to to go and find dig to to kind of find something and I I sort of wonder now on one hand with technology because there's information is just everywhere does that limit our curiosity or does it does it help us because because it's there and you can you can go and find it? I don't know. Well, I, yeah, I, I have a duality with that, probably like yourself. Um, I, I my 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 overview of the digital realm is that there's so much commercialism is in it, and their and their their whole intent is to they're, they're trying to buy your attention, so therefore they feed you the same stuff that you've watched before, just slightly nuanced. Yeah. Uh, because this is, this is the nature of algorithms. Yeah. Um, but then I will, you know, one in a 20 times, I'll see something I'll, and I'll be interested in it and it will spark my interest. So it's sort of, it's a double-edged sword. Mm. I think curiosity is a, 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 an ingredient of youth. And I think to retain it is extremely important if you're to be an artist. And going back to the film thing, when I observe Peter Greenaway, I don't know if you know the director, Peter Greenaway. Yeah. I, I observe him now talking about film in his 80s i still see a man who's still a child mm. and, I, and i'm awe of that i love that and cynicism is the biggest killer yes yes that's that's very true isn't it yeah again again the, you know that that, that that sort of childhood almost purity and you know lack of inhibitions and just curious about the world and things like that I think it's kind yeah. of fascinating to have. Yeah, and and, and also as, as on a, on a sort of a global scale, I, I've been thinking a lot about recently this this shift that we underwent uh, with, the, with the, the you know the sort of the the um, Copernicus uh, Galileo mm. the the idea that that we are um, we're not the center of the universe uh, that we're not the most important yeah. thing. We thought, we, and the sun went round us, and the moon went round us, and the stars went round us, and we were. It was. It, we're still relatively new to this idea that oh sh shit, we're not that important. And and I yeah. think, and so I was watching Carl Sagan talk about this the other day that we, yeah. it, so much of our language um, is based around this notion that, that we're, we're still the center of, of the universe. Um, uh, the sun rises, he says. You know, yeah. the sun rises it doesn't rise at all. We're going round it. Yes, but, 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 that's very true. But we're, we're obsessed with this. We still have this inbuilt notion that we're so the most important thing on the planet. Um, and uh, so, I, and I, th I think th th that's what kills me more than anything is the arrogance I, I hear so many times from people that, that that now is the most important time, that we're wiser than we've ever been. Mm. Um, 
uh, when I hear talk about the the, the, the library of Ale the great library of uh, Alexandria, I think it was that was burnt down by sort of um, barbarians in the in the thousand plus years ago. They 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 say that there is information in that library that we still haven't rediscovered that that they yeah. knew right now. So we we. We have to be curious. We have to be curious. I feel. Yeah, I think that I think again, there's, there's this, the, the, you know, talking about that that kind of like arrogance that we're the sort of the center of everything. I think it shows up in our relationship with with nature as well. You know that that nature is there and and animals are there for us. You know, and if we thought that we're actually part of that, you know, I'm thinking, you know, kind of, you know, thinking about trees with its sort of mycelium network and the ability to share things and. You know, not even, you know, they don't even sort of share just, you know, they share across, you know, species, tree species. Mushrooms do the same. But yes. we we seem to be, we want to be isolated. We want to be the, the centre. Isolation is the thing. We, we think we're somehow made of different parts than the rest of the universe. And mm. We're not. We're just not, as you say. It, yeah. It's happening in different forms and in different ways. So arrogant we are sometimes. Yeah. We still are. I mean, many people aren't. Yeah. You know, the we have to prove that many people aren't, but but, <laughs> but but it's it's inbuilt in us this 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 that we're number one in some way. We're really not. Yeah, and I, I think that makes us comic comic. Really, I think we're a, we're a, we're a, we're a funny. We're hilarious, really, to look at. We're so up our own backside. I think if ever, if any, if anybody else looked at us, see the way that we behave, they would be like Jesus. That's how to screw things up. Yeah, and 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 and. <laughs> Yeah, and to think that 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 this is the only place where life exists. Yeah, daft, stupid. So, what's uh, after the album comes? What's next? I think I think you you you're at the London Jazz Festival, yeah, Festival, oh, aren't you? In, in uh, the Earth in Hackney. I don't know if you've ever been to that place. Yeah, Earth. yeah, it's an amazing place. Big H at the end. Um, it is an amazing place. A, a, a converted sort of Art Deco cinema with all the seats taken. You know, it's yeah. So that's our relaunch, our what we're calling the unpausing of the pause. Uh, we'll be doing a, quite a few things based around that phrase leading up to it. Um, and then we will tour it probably next year. More UK, probably in the spring. More UK, more Europe, more festivals, and more Europe again. Um, and I think my ambition, and I think it's, it's, um, I think it's doable, is to then record something else at the end of next year and then mm. do a big, big show in a couple of years' time. That's that's my path for this. That's wow. that's, that's keeping me going. Amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, somewhere you know, like a we love a concert hall. I just want to play a big concert hall again with the, with the trio. I think it's perfectly doable. I just think we have to get yeah. drive, get to Barbican or so somewhere like that. I wasn't going to say it because I didn't want to jinx it. But yeah, no, 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 no sorry, <laughs> no, but we. <laughs> No, no, not at all. No, no, I didn't say it. no. Um, uh, we played there in twenty. Well, we played there a couple of times, and actually, the best gig I think we'd all say the best gig we ever did was in the Barbican. It was wow. an unbelievable night, and and actually, we were in tears as we walked out. For some reason, the audience were just with us as we came out, and and they wouldn't stop cheering, and we, we, we were in tears as before we started. It was beautiful. So that must um, have been that must have been the best feeling on earth. It was incredible. I, and I looked at Evan, <laughs> looked at Evan, who's kind of like. Um, He's kind of like uh, what's his name? Um, what's the a Tigger in uh, in Winnie the Pooh? Oh yeah, yeah. And I looked at him, and he was he was dancing across the stage. He was just uh, <laughs> he was lifted, elevated, and kind of going, ah, you know. Um, uh, yeah, we were sort of it, it was all a bit involuntary, and uh, it was it was it blew my mind. It breathtaking. Uh, that that is a lovely thing, and for a for an only child who seeks, uh, uh, you know, secretly or not so secretly seeks. Um, confirmation and adulation it yeah. was good tonic and lasted me at least for a couple of weeks that one amazing brilliant Neil lovely to talk to you lovely to talk to you nice.